I want to welcome you this evening to Science Study Break. For those of you who've been coming since the very beginning, this is Science Study Break number 22. So thank you all for making it so successful and coming and enjoying it. Uh, this is a program, if you're new to it, where we evaluate presentations of science, technology, engineering, and medicine as they are shown in popular culture. We have been doing TV shows or movies to look at things like this, but in our last time study, right, we moved into the world of graphic novels, and we're hoping to do more of that. So here's the legalese that you need to know. You can see that many cameras are all around you, and that sound is being recorded, and so your images may be broadcast. So you've been notified. We want to thank you for coming out. We know that you could have been at the Death Cab for Cutie Show. So we appreciate you being here this evening. And we also want to thank our generous supporters of the series, University Federal Credit Union, who make this program possible. So give them a hand. So we have an archive online where you can see some of our past programming just to give you a feel for the flavor of Science Study Break and what sort of things we cover. And you can also look at some of our past programs on the UT Austin YouTube channel. This one will also be on the YouTube channel in a few weeks or so after uh, this program. If you'd like to suggest a science study break program, either a presenter that you would like to see, or a TV show, or a movie, or now a graphic novel that you'd like to be uh, given the science study break treatment, you'll notice that on the arms of your chairs there's some feedback forms. So please use the forms to let us know if there's some programming that you recommend for the future. We've got pencils here if you're missing a pencil. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Science Study Break, or you can follow UTLSL for the Life Science Library. You can also follow us on Facebook, and if you're tweeting this event, the hashtag is SSBPACE. And now, I'd like to give you some quick tips on what the UT Libraries can do for you by introducing From the Tip Jar, which is a UT Library series focusing on quick library tips that come out every other Monday and that help you uh, find ideas to squeeze the most out of your UT Library experience, do efficient research, uh, save money by using some of the library features and things like that. So for example, you can retrieve AV, AV material from the library, to where one closer to you, or you can save money by checking out equipment in the libraries. So this is on the News for Undergraduates blog. Every other Monday, be looking for the tip jar. And if you have a tip that you'd like us to have, uh, or to cover, then you can send something to lib-instruction email address here. Okay. So tonight's program looks at the biology and social life Apes, and it uses scenes from Project Nim and from Planet of the Apes movies. And we're fortunate to have Dr. Claude Bramlett with us. Dr. Bramlett holds a BA and MA in Anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin and a PhD in Anthropology from UC Berkeley. From March 1963 to May 1964, he was employed by the Southwest Foundation for Research and Education in San Antonio, Texas, as a manager of the Darajani Primate Research Station in Kenya, East Africa, accompanied by his biologist wife, Sharon. He's been with UT's anthropology department since 1967, where he's taught courses on primate behavior, primate anatomy and taxonomy, and field methods in primatology and primate evolution. His research interests include the behavioral biology of linens and baboons in captivity, Behavior changes in social structure in Cercopithecus and Papio, heritability of behavior in Gwinnins and Baboons, and the socio-ecology of Cebus, Atiles, Samiri, and Alwada. He's a member of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, the American Anthropological Association, the American Society of Primatologists, the International Primatology Society, and the Animal Behavior Society. In 2003, he became an emeritus professor and in addition to his continuing writing projects, Dr. Bramlett and Sharon now spend much time in the company of Ms. E. Lamas. Please welcome Dr. Claude Bramlett. Before I begin, I'd like to add something to the curriculum vita, since some of you are going to be professors someday. When I was 11 years old, I played hooky from school and I explored the old schoolhouse. And I discovered that there was an attic above the auditorium that they stored old books. 
And I would play hooky and climb up the stair. It was actually a ladder to the attic and sit there in the semi-dark and just loved reading old books. And one of the books I read was an autobiography of a Crow Indian chief by the name of Plinico. And it just turned me on. I thought, this is fantastic. So I sat down and wrote a letter, literally addressed it to the University of Texas, Austin, Texas. And I wasn't surprised, but now in retrospect, I'm very surprised. The university wrote me back. And they said, the subject you're interested in is called anthropology. And that and the correspondence that followed is really why I'm here today. So when you get to be faculty and that little kid writes you, answer him, it is important. You've all seen this before, so I thought I'd cheat. This is old vocabulary. It's not new, but it's simple, and it's the vocabulary I like to use. The movies Planet of the Apes really started as a series of two movies, and in the first one, three American astronauts get in a rocket and take off, and they travel through time back into the future and uh, arrive on Earth to discover that human civilization has destroyed itself with, an atomic, with atomic war. And humans have reverted to a primitive status. Uh, they've lost their technology. And in their place, the, the great apes have risen to a technological level of, uh, of early humans and become the dominant technology of the planet. And of course, the human astronauts are treated very badly by the apes. The second movie, which really completed this series, in the second movie, the apes took the human starship, spaceship, rocket, and travel, three of their astronauts travel back to Earth, going back in time to the present day. And of course, the ape astronauts are treated very badly by humans. One of the ape astronauts is female, and she gives birth to a, a son. And that son provides the genetic basis for the rise of the apes to the human niche in the distant future when nuclear war has destroyed human ecology. Dr. Zero, her husband Cornelius, and little Milo. 
The most dangerous man is Little Milo. Why? The time is 1973. The place is right here on Earth. How did they get here? What is their reception? Welcome, gentlemen, to the United... Escape from the planet of the Apes. Their adventures are completely fresh, completely new. Astonishingly different from what you experience in Planet of the Apes and beneath the Planet of the Apes. At first, feared and imprisoned. We'll take the female first. I love this general, the Wisconsin general test apparatus. Oh, well, she seems to be pretty smart. All right. Well, why doesn't she take me? Because I know bananas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know that. We know who our friends are, I know our enemies. And how in the name of God are we to know that unless we communicate? We can speak, so I won't come. The president convenes a special board of inquiry. Have you a name? Zero. Does the other one talk? I'll do what she likes. <laughs> Embraced by our civilization, the nation gives them a hero's welcome. Address, please. To <laughs> whom? Obviously, these were humans wearing Halloween masks, so I don't need to talk about locomotion or anything like that. Uh, the two things about the film that I would like to point out, uh, they use the apes speaking human speech. The ape vocal track and the ape motor cortex is very, very different from the human. And apes, particularly chimpanzees that are human raised, have learned to make human speech words Things like papa, cup, simple things. But uh, the reality is they could learn to speak words, but the acoustics and everything will be so different, a movie audience wouldn't understand English spoken by uh, an ape vocal tract and motor cortex. Now, there's another interesting thing I thought about that movie. It set up a caste system where the police are the gorillas, the administrators are orangs, and the scientists are the chimpanzees, and the humans are vermin. Uh, there are some substantial differences in, uh, between various apes. And yet, generalizations don't work no more than that they would work for making generalizations about humans, because there is variation. But uh, chimpanzee, the white-faced common chimpanzee males, are often very, have very explosive temperaments. So in a moment, they can flash and be aggressive and do great damage to you, and then a few moments later be calm and uh, you know, friends again. It makes the adult male chimpanzee a really dangerous animal to, to be around unless you're equipped to deal with an adult male chimpanzee. Orangs, in contrast, don't have the explosive temperament to really do you injury on a moment's notice. 
orangs, if you offend them, if you're a zookeeper or whatever, the orang is not likely to immediately attack you, but he'll brood about it and think about it and plan and retaliate at some point in the future, maybe days later, when you've long since forgotten the encounter or the occasion, then they may, re uh, they may get their retaliation. So there are some interesting differences. We're talking about huge potential for millions of people. Our therapy enables the brain to repair itself. We call it the cure. I want you to stop testing issues. ASAP. We test one subject. I want to make sure it's safe. I designed the 112 for repair. The stage has gone way beyond that. I'm going to increase the tests. The skills that far exceed that of a human counterpart. Is this wrong, Will? It works. And what about Caesar? Where does he fit in? That ship's company property. He hasn't spent any time with other ships. They're not people, you know. We try to control things that are not meant to be controlled.
why computer graphics have come a long way. And the bipedalism is overdone. But uh, there are a couple of things that, that this movie suggests that I, I think are really worth noting. One was there was a, a line in there, you know, they're not human. It raises an interesting question. One of the things that people did early on in studying chimpanzees is have them do uh, sorting. You sort objects into shape, into color, into any kind of category that, that the researcher could imagine. And uh, an animal like Vicky was very, very good at sorting. Now, these are chimpanzees that have worked long and spent many hours with humans. And so they're, they're humanized. So if you give an animal like Vicky, which she did, and give her photographs and say, sort into animals and to humans. And so she'll sort, put the human photographs into the human stack and the animal photographs into the animal stack. A picture of her own chimpanzee father, she'll put in the animal stack. When she comes to her picture, it goes in the human stack. And that's a, a very common reaction for the chimps that have that kind of social experience. So it, it raises an interesting question, you know, is she human or is she chimpanzee? Species-wise, she's very much a chimpanzee. But if you ask her, she's human. And that raises a number of other intellectual issues of uh, self and other things. Think about it. Now, could a chimp match a human in intelligence uh, even without the magic potion? This chimp is meant to count just like humans, but how does his memory ability hold up? In this test, the numbers 1 to 9 were quickly replaced by blank squares, and the chimp had to remember their position on the screen. The three young chimps tested were all very good at the task, leading researchers to believe they had something similar to photographic memory. Young chimps outperformed both their mothers and human university students. When the numbers were flashed on the screen for shorter periods of time, humans had trouble remembering their order, whereas the chimps performed just as well. It's the first time chimps have beaten humans at a memory test. Now, one interesting thing about people, and scientists are people too, you can be smart and dumb in the same sentence, in the same thought. And uh, that's one of the things that makes science interesting too. Uh, there's a whole series of dogmas that, uh, when I was a university student, were readily repeated in uh, an amazing number of contexts. And uh, the only humans kinds of paradigms. I very vividly remember being in class here at UT when a professor that I, that I respected very much gave a nice lecture on the only human sequence. And uh, one of the things he pointed out is that chimpanzees are incapable of accurate or aimed throwing because it's just anatomically impossible for them. And he went on through the long list. But he finished the lecture with uh, a humorous story about a very famous chimpanzee at the Brooklyn Zoo who collected his feces and would bombard the tourists with deadly accuracy. And I'm sitting there in class and saying, wait a minute, uh, there's something not quite right here. And I, I could go on, but you get the general idea. A lot of the early chimpanzee information comes from people who had zoos, who had private menageries. Uh, but uh, one of the first really serious large laboratories, it took place during World War I. And the, I recommend Kohler to you. It's an interesting thing. A lot of these old publications, you can get them on Google Scholar for free. But, uh, Kohler's publication is interesting because it's still in print, which tells you something about its content. 
Kohler looked at chimpanzee problem solving, how they do well with solving puzzles and so on, but he wasn't interested in measuring are they smart, or are they smarter than humans, or are they dumber than humans. He was working to try to answer the question, do they have insight? The kind of human thinking that takes place when you look at an array of information and integrate that to solve a problem. And he demonstrated very, very beautifully that uh, chimpanzees do this quite readily. The, the guy in the picture, just for your curiosity, his name is Sultan, one of Kohler's nine chimpanzees. In the United States, uh, the first really serious chimpanzee laboratory was Robert Yerkes. And uh, if you ever want to look up and read about a, a curious figure that's an amazing accumulation of, uh, of good ideas and bad ideas, perhaps, you know, take a look at, at Yerkes. He's fantastic. Now, Yerkes had gotten interested in apes by going around to menageries and people. Uh, a, a lady in Cuba who had a bunch of apes in her collection. And when he had opportunity to buy a pair of bushmeat chimpanzees, uh, he emptied his bank account, literally, and bought them, and emptied the chicken coop in the backyard, and drafted his children as caretakers. Uh, my family will get see some familiarity of that. And uh, set up to study these two chimps. He named them Chim and Pan. Uh, Chim is the one on his right hand. I'm sorry. Chim is the one on his left hand. Pan is the one on his right. Chim is a bonobo, a pygmy chimpanzee. But they didn't know that the, there was such a thing at that time. Now, these two chimps didn't live very long. Uh, Pan was in the terminal stages of tuberculosis and only lived a few months. Uh, the other, the bonobo, died a short time afterwards from pneumonia. But they ignited Yerkes' curiosity and interest. And with the help of Yale University, he set up the first major laboratory to systematically study chimpanzee mental abilities in the United States, at, in Florida, at Orange Park and it later became the Yerkes Regional Primate Center in Georgia. Now, in the period up through World War II, they established essentially the mental abilities of chimpanzees to an amazing degree. Uh, cooperation, problem solving, even use of money, almost anything they could think of, and they did a lot of work with gorillas as well. But it had no impact. It had no impact because all the professors, most of the professors around the country, were still listing the only humans list and routine. So Yerke's work and Kohler's work were known, but literally not integrated into the curriculum. This is not a good idea. Within weeks, she is making astonishing discoveries. Chimps will hunt down large mammals and eat them. And more shopping, they not only use tools, but make them as well. A chimpanzee 
It's actually modifying a natural object to suit it to a specific purpose, thus making a tool. When Lewis Leakey first heard about the tool using in Gombe, he got extremely excited and said, now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or include chimpanzees for humans. Now, I admire and respect Jane Goodall a great deal, and this, this film does not do justice to her. It was not easy. It didn't happen rapidly. Uh, you're talking about years of her life. Actually, the first years literally getting nowhere to accomplish this. But she did contribute a great deal of knowledge about wild chimpanzees. But the distribution of that film had another impact. You, you heard the narrator say, you know, nothing was known about chimpanzees. Uh, the, there really wasn't anything about chimpanzee abilities, intelligence and mental abilities, the tool making, the diet, all of that was previously known, but ignored. And suddenly the professor in class couldn't stand there and go through his list of only humans, only humans, only humans, when all the students out there had seen this film and knew it wasn't so. And it had a tremendous impact in the curriculum and in the way that the scientific community began to think and work with animal behavior. Sometimes things are more complicated than you think. By the way, it is really a bad idea if you're doing field work with chimpanzees to become part of the troop because chimpanzees aren't nice to each other in a way that humans would like them to be. There were real projects like Project X. The Air Force did do those things. And uh, there was a project like that here at UT. And one of the things that the UT project contributed was the first American astronauts. Sam, rhesus monkey born at, you know, in a UT facility here in Austin, uh, actually was the first American astronaut to survive the trip into space and come back alive and be recovered successfully. And uh, Sam, well, it's, I'll put in a plug for UT. You know, then the first astronaut is, uh, was born and, and an ex-student, yes, at UT. You've been watching before the presentation the sequence of language experiments, but uh, let me point out a, a couple of things. Uh, the first really successful project to teach sign language to a chimpanzee was the Washoe experiment with the gardeners in the late 60s. Now they have a problem. This is at a time when everybody knows only humans have language. And they knew they had an uphill battle. They knew that a lot of the scientific community was going to say it, the chimp is imitating, the chimp is copying. Whatever the chimp is doing, it's not using sign language. So when they decided to present their program to the scientific community, they booked an auditorium much larger than this. And they put all the scientists over on one side all the anthropologists over on one side, and went out into the neighborhood and recruited native speakers of American Sign Language, uh, members of the deaf community, and put them on the other side of the auditorium. And they had two translators, one translating for the scientists and one translating for the deaf. And so the scientists 
the anthropologist sat there for the evening and watched this film, which was quite a long film, and they had to be translated to, but the audience that were out of the deaf community needed no translator. You know, they were laughing and reading and reacting <laughs> to the chimp's signs very readily. And it was it made a very, very convincing presentation that Washo actually was signing. It wasn't, uh, you know, some kind of some kind of fake. So if you ever presented with that kind of dilemma, think of a solution, you know, similar, at least as, ingen as ingenious. Sarah, but David Premack did a number of things, you know, Sarah and other chimps. But to me, the most impressive was they were using symbols, like Chinese characters, except they're not, on a magnetic board and make sentences. And he was able to use them to communicate new word meanings. Like if she didn't know the color brown as a word, they could present her with a sentence, brown is the color of chocolate. And she could use the color brown correctly after that. Uh, Sarah came under a lot of criticism later as uh, being a clever hands uh, phenomenon. Lana is a chimp that uses a computer keyboard. It's actually a, a keyboard design for her to, to make simple requests and simple statements. But uh, that doesn't mean she's simple. Coco is a gorilla. The gorillas at the San Francisco Zoo are bushmeat gorillas. And very often, a bushmeat gorilla that's been raised sort of outside of a gorilla context, when the female has her first infant, she doesn't take care of it. She rejects it. And subsequent infants, then they normally do take care of. So Coco's mother rejected her, and she had to be human reared. Penny Patterson got permission from the zoo to teach this infant gorilla American Sign Language. And it progressed very nicely. When Coco began to mature into a young adult female, she was a very valuable animal. And the zoo, of course, wanted to put her back into exhibit into the colony. Uh, she's a very valuable animal. At that time, her dead carcass was worth more than 10,000 bucks on the market for dissection. So you can appreciate that there was a real conflict of, of, a, of values going on here. And some of us, at least I was hoping that it would go to court and that the, at least flaky California judges would put Coco onto the stand to testify in her own behalf and thus establish in California, at least, that gorillas were persons. But uh, the zoo caved in and Penny won, and we'll talk more about Coco later. The Nim Chimsky project, and we'll show a film on this. It's, Terrence did this specifically to demonstrate that the Washoe project was wrong, and that, uh, that Washoe really wasn't using sign language spontaneously. I don't know how to say, the, pronounce the name AI. I, the, the Japanese primary center, began to do projects in chimpanzee intelligence. And you just saw a clip on chimpanzee intelligence from that, that project. Chantech was one of the earliest projects that did sign language with orangutans. And then Kanzi is a, a bonobo, a black-faced chimpanzee that uh, begin to learn to communicate by sitting and watching him trying to teach his mom. His mom rejected the learning, but uh, Kanzi did accept it and is now an extraordinarily capable bonobo with using a lexigram, essentially a keyboard or uh, an object printed diagram, uh, lexigram page to communicate and has a tremendous understanding, a tremendous voc vocabulary of spoken English to him. I thought, wouldn't it be exciting to communicate with a chimp and find out what I'm thinking? So why not 
agent sign language, and that's essentially why I started the project then. I know nothing about chimpanzees. Her wanted me to take him into my home as if he were a child. The fact that we could share language with an animal seemed very radical at that time. There was no family discussion. It was just, oh, we're having a chip. We're going to teach a sign language. Nobody in the house really was fluent in sign language. Everything was about treating him like a human being. He liked alcohol. He loved driving fast in cars. I first met him for a couple of months. It seemed completely natural. I couldn't believe it. It was the 70s. Her wanted a schedule and charted progress. I didn't supply that. There was utter chaos. There were no journals. There were no logbooks. This was a scientific project. I had implicit faith that they would learn science. I just mapped out a teaching plan for them, and I did it. They was learning signs rapidly. They're going up, 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 up. I could see I was succeeding. There was all this excitement and hype about the project. I had a relationship with a chimpanzee, and I had conversations with an species. being this meek little huggable toy to a robust young chimpanzee. He's gonna be big, five to six times the strength of men. He's got fangs. This is 37 stitches. In that sense, he's becoming a your wife. It didn't seem to be a cause for a I never regarded him as a child. I regarded him as a scientific project. Nobody keeps a chimp for more than five years. That's the best time of my life. I've never had such a good time. Except maybe I had a great for that The reality of it is it's not a doll, it's not a toy, it's not a human, it's a gym. I didn't care about the language argument after a while. It didn't matter to me. He might not have had sentences or grammar, but there's no question that there was communication going on, and I saw it clearly. I'm not sure what happened there, but the, uh, the NIM project is a very poorly designed and executed experiment. And NIM's progress, I think, you know, reflected that. Uh, it's hard to teach sign language from a group of teachers who don't do sign language. Now, I want to show you a little bit of Coco and uh, another gorilla companion, Coco and Michael. Uh, remember this? Look in the back seat as it goes along. On the campus of Stanford University, Benny Patterson, 28, a graduate student in psychology. See the gorilla in the back seat, too? <laughs> Is the language used by the deaf in North America. Now, the clip you're going to see a is a teaching clip, not a testing clip. Words. For instance, pretty, happy, sad, share, share. See, she's training Sheer. here. Sheer. Sleep, babe. Occasion produced 
500 different words at least once, although not all of these have qualified by our strict criteria, which is spontaneous and appropriate use on half the days of a given month. show a short clip of Michael and he's asked to tell his memory of his mother. Now Michael is a bushmeat you know infant so his last memory of his mother was when she was killed and this is what he how he describes it. Not good grammar, but I think very powerful. Now, quickly, a couple of, of rambling comments. The classic test of whether a, a species has a person at home, whether you're self-aware, is a mirror test where you look at yourself in the mirror and recognize yourself. And uh, from Bramble's point of view, there isn't a concept called a home range, which we assume that lots of different species have. And to me, if you have a mental map of your home range, self has to be on it or you don't know where you are. And so for me, it's, a not, it's not an issue. A lot of the contemporary animal behavior people uh, argue that the difference between humans and non-human primates is that non-human primates have no theory of mind, that they know stuff, but they don't know that they know stuff. So they cannot attribute uh, mental states to others. And to me, this doesn't make sense. The ability to attribute a state of mind, to, to attribute intention to others, is a very powerful ability. Uh, he's watching me, he's following me, is he hungry? Is it play? We do very readily do intention. And uh, I have every confidence that at least a lot of other non-human species do intention as a regular part of their mental processes. Now, I want to close with a couple of quick things. One is the status of the apes at the moment. In 2000, in 2000 NIH legisla legislation was passed that NIH no longer does research with chimps, no breeding. They're essentially put into retirement. And uh, since then, legislation was passed that makes it not reversible. They can't bring them back out. The place that's responsible for retiring all of these guys is a place called Chimp Haven in Georgia. There are a couple of other smaller sites. Uh, the Center for the Great Apes specializes in show business retired apes. Uh, the Washington University site is the leftovers from the Washoe Project and so on. But uh, the, the great apes in research are, uh, are going to be retired. Now, the current thing that's happening in 1979, chimpanzees were listed as threatened. 
in 1990, they were listed as endangered if they were in the wild, but captive animals were not listed as endangered on the hope that they would be propagated to protect the species. In reality, captive chimps are not being propagated. NIH isn't doing any breeding at all. And comments will close this month on whether or not to make all chimpanzees endangered. And my expectation is they will all be listed as endangered. So this presents some problems. Chimp habitat is not protected. Uh, population growth in some of the African countries is still climbing dramatically. Countries like China are looking at areas that are chimp habitat for uh, future food development, agribusiness. Uh, China is looking to Africa to feed it in the future. And you get the general idea. I could go on for a long time. But one point I want to make is the bushmeat trade. Uh, bushmeat, where you hunt the great apes and eat them, or sell their carcasses. When you hunt them, you wind up with infants that you find other uses for. And when they get a little larger, you can eat them. And I'd like to make the bushmeat trade a little personal. In July 1970, I got a call from the airport saying, come pick up your monkey. And I said, you got the wrong person. I'm not expecting any monkeys. And they read me the list, the address on the box. It was me. So I went out to the airport and uh, was shocked and astonished. This is what was in the box. And uh, we called him Huddles. At, he lasted about a month here before we found a home for him, the best place I could find at the time was uh, the San Diego Zoo. Uh, Bushmeat is not a good idea. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Brown? I couldn't hear it, sorry. Uh, it was an undergraduate here at UT uh, who was married to a zoology graduate student. He was doing his dissertation research on amphibians in Africa. She saw this bushmeat animal in a market and decided to rescue it. It cost her five bucks to get the paperwork. She put it in a box and mailed it. Yes. Um, I saw on the, on the slide that there were a lot of chimpanzee communication experiments going on in the, in the 60s, 70s. The latest one there was 1980s. Is there anything going on now? Uh, Kanzi is still going on. The, uh, the survivors of the Washoe project are still going. Uh, yes, there are, but they're, they're in sort of retirement circumstances. But are they still communicating? Yes. One of the things they did with the Washoe project is uh, when she had uh, exposure to other chimps, the humans stopped signing. And they did that deliberately to see if she would teach signs to the infants. And uh, she did. She thought that the humans had gone nuts to suddenly stop talking, but yes. <laughs> Calco is still going. Yes? You said that um, the, the, the vocal like, uh, motor processes and everything make it so that um, verbal speech um, is they, they can do They can do words, but you wouldn't recognize them. Is, are, there, are there researchers out there who have kind of like There were some of the early ones, like Vicky, uh, they, they tried this, and they could understand a few of her words. But uh, it, it didn't get far enough along that they would follow it very much. Someone like Lana, who's using a keyboard to talk with a computer, she makes sounds as she's doing it that the humans haven't. The humans don't know what she's doing. I mean, she knows, but they don't. 
yeah. Uh, the best guess would be, yeah, yes, you can elicit speech out of it, not human kinds of things, strings, but it would be so different that it's hard for someone who didn't know the animal to recognize what the word was. I remember hearing a long time ago about an individual uh, who was researching uh, Washo and said that the animal had actually synthesized uh, compound words for, for things that we've never seen before. Yes. For example, he saw a duck and it made the phrase water bird. Uh, the Cocoa Project, yes, yes, this happens. Because there are a lot of circumstances that arise that they haven't been taught words to deal with. So do they ask questions like, what is that, if they don't recognize Yes, and uh, some of them will point. Uh, many of them didn't. So it's, it's hard to make a universal statement because uh, a lot of it will depend on circumstance and experience. Does that make any sense? But the things like the Cocoa Project, the Washoe Project, where humans have worked with the animal for so many years, they're family members. Uh, Penny Patterson would never you know, give up Cocoa. It would be like losing a family member. And I'm sure Cocoa feels the same way toward Penny. Remember, the socialized animals Coco thinks she's human. Now, she knows the difference between the species, a human and gorilla. But if you gave her a classification, she's going to put herself in the human category. Yes? Um, is there, you know, like, I've heard of this one area where people learn sign language for themselves and they develop their own syntax. Like, do, do the chimps or gorillas, are they able to use correct syntax or grammar? Or do they just uh, one problem is that when these projects often started, the humans involved did not know American Sign Language. And so the humans weren't good at the correct grammar to begin with. And so the, the grammar that you would think of as inherent in American Sign Language may not be in some of these projects because the participants didn't have it to begin with. Yes. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> the, the reality is, uh, when you get down to really basic issues, we learned about those pretty early on. But getting them accepted in a broader scientific community has been slow. I don't expect, for example, uh, something that Coco does to revolutionize what we don't know already. But I might be surprised. Yes? You mentioned how uh, a chimp at one point can be suddenly violent and then the next one can be friendly. What's yes? the mentality of culture that? I don't know. I assume it's personality. And now, not all chimps are like that. Uh, apparently, the bonobo is much less prone to explosive aggression. Uh, gibbons can be like that. Because in given play, uh, aggressive contact is a, is a common thing. If you're another given, you deal with it. If you're human, you bleed. And so uh, that in some ways, gibbons are more dangerous than chimps because they're small, they look harmless, and you don't, you know, you don't think they're going to be as dangerous. Uh, I, I used to volunteer to clean a gibbon cage when I was a graduate student. and. Uh, she loved to play games with you. Uh, you had to watch her every moment, or she'd have your ear. And she could be across the, you know, the space in a flash. And it hurt very much. 
And so it was something we all knew about and watched. A, a zoo caretaker in Europe died. He's given playing the same game, cut the, the, you know, the veins in his neck and bled to death there. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I, a small child playing with the gibbon that his cage I cleaned uh, had the flexor tendons cut to her hand, just playing with the gibbon. The gibbon didn't mean any harm, but happens. Yes. I don't know how to answer the question because I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I would be surprised <laughs> because the, the culture will differ greatly from one human group to another into how things are structured. Chimpanzees aren't human, but uh, it doesn't mean there's not a person there. When I say they're not human, I mean they're not a human species. Yes? So you said that um, one of the projects that you worked with was the Digital Zoology Project, the Washington Project, the Humanitarian Project. How did they go about digitally? Oh, Terence was firmly convinced that Washoe uh, really wasn't signing, that the humans were signing to her, and then Washoe was copying them. And he based that on the film that he saw. Uh, so he, he didn't think that, that, that the chimp was really communicating and thinking and, and doing the sign language the same way. He thought it was imitation. And that's been a real problem in the scientific community because if somebody's a skeptic, it's really, really hard to, to move their skepticism. I mean, if you think it's anatomically impossible for a chimpanzee to throw, then them throwing their feces is not a conflict in your mind. <laughs> yes? Not that I know of. Were they capable of, of learning sign language like the greater apes? I don't know. Uh, the one gibbon that I had experience with, I wouldn't try it. <laughs> I, if I tried it, I'd wear a helmet. <laughs> Thank you very much.